concentration for application in other areas. And it is this, now almost unused faculty, unused because it is no longer called upon for the maintenance of the organism, which provides the key to the scheme of magic, which I have found most useful. Here we have a reservoir of potential concentration, which is not being used. Because he is a lazy creature of habit, man prefers comfort to adventure, stasis to motion in both the physical and mental sense. Only the greatest minds break out of this stasis to produce something new, vital and essential. For the vast majority who can only see their own capabilities during rare moments of unusual lucidity, life goes on as normal, the supreme being rejected in favor of the habitual. Traditionally, the magician forced himself to do these things which his personality decreed would wait until tomorrow. This method failed because it relied on the imposition of new habits, albeit self-imposed rather than arbitrary ones. without stating its aims. It has been said, there's a censorship mechanism which prevents us from performing to capacity. Whether this mechanism is seen as a function of the holy guardian angel, as a natural and necessary mental barrier, or as some have seen it, as the work of demons or aliens resident in the mind, it is clearly an objective of the magician to bypass or destroy it. The magician must map his consciousness from within, wearing down the censorship mechanism proportionally to the increase in his self-knowledge until it is no longer interfering with his overall strategy. The first tactic toward this end is a catalog of activities. There are many reasons why we do things. Indeed, we sometimes find it amusing to do something for no reason at all. The magician must analyze every action he makes and satisfactorily explain to himself the reason for each action until his mind begins to clear through the increase in licit activity and the dropping out of illicit activity. At that point, he would be performing willed and necessary actions, licit, and not bending to the accretions of habit or appetite. The possible reasons for the performance or omission of any activity are several. One, necessity, health, welfare, income, evolution, development. This last category can be misleading. Activities such as reading or making whatever could be classified under the heading of development. The magician should be ruthless in analyzing them. Two, habit. Smoking is an obvious example. Leaving aside the question of health, which does not apply to all habitual actions, it is necessary only to identify habitual activities. These might then be subdivided into habits which interfere with category one functions and those which do not. In either case, the magician should desist from their performance. Three, appetite. This includes eating, drinking, sex, drug abuse, and any activity whose only result is to stimulate the organism in some way spurious to the needs of necessity or nature. Four, fear. That is, fear of the consequences should certain actions not be performed. Five, laziness. Any of the categories listed above could also belong to this category, even income. The man who uses mundane work as an excuse not to do those things he really needs to do is a clerk who will never become an Einstein. Six, unselfassuredness. I will not prepare a meal because I am not a good cook. Forced into the situation, any man can become a Robinson Crusoe. I am not a good telepath is insufficient reason to not try and perhaps succeed. Seven, time measuring. Activities which serve only to amuse until a time when more important activities can be performed. 
further reasons might be listed as A, bravado, B, pride, C, anxiety to please, D, ambition, usually a conditioned or self-conditioned reflex, which serves no other purpose than the fulfillment of B or C, E, the herd complex, doing as others do, and F, stimulus, response. The observation and critical analysis of one's actions is of paramount importance, but this cannot be done in a vacuum. For the magician, skilled as he is in the methods of conjuration and sigilization, the easiest way to become acquainted with and to destroy the subtle tricks of the mind, which prevent him from working to capacity, is to personify them as demons, each with its own name and sigil. To be charitable toward the practitioner of trade, traditional magic, it may be that when he evoked Behemoth, demon of the delights of the belly, and then banished him, he was attempting to understand his own gross appetites and thereby to rid himself of them. But even if this were the case, an operation of such an isolated nature would have had little or no permanent effect on him. In any case, there is little benefit in identifying with a demon of someone else's creation, since that notion is sure to manifest in different ways for a different individual, or in some cases, not at all.